and print, digital, um, audio, whatever that looks like. So we're going to have some really good stuff coming up for you at the convention. We're hoping that tonight's panel is a good introduction to people who are maybe just starting to enter investigative journalism or are interested in doing so, or at least seeing what that looks like for your career. So excited for um, to hear from the panel tonight. And I know Walter is going to do a great job moderating. While you're um, sitting here listening, make sure that you're following us on all of our social media platforms. I'll put that in the chat so that um, you can stay up to date as we start coming up with more programming and just things that you'll want to be aware of. All right, well, thank and you. And I'm an investigative reporter at WLWT in Cincinnati, which I did not mention. <laughs> Are you turning something tonight? Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. And Jatera just got six Emmy nominations. Those were announced yesterday. So congratulations on six Emmy oh, nominations. Yeah. That's amazing. Very sweet of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So we're going to pitch it over to Curtis McLeod now. Good evening, everyone. And congratulations, Jatera. So, so well deserved. But good evening, everyone. Uh, Curtis McLeod. I'm an anchor and investigative reporter in Orlando, Florida at Spectrum News here. And i um, excited to be a part of this effort. I know Jatera, the entire board, everyone putting in a lot of work to make all of this happen. And when I tell you, we've got some really, really good stuff lined up for the actual convention and beyond. It is killer. I'm so excited about it and so excited to be part of it. Jatera pretty much said everything that needs to be said. We are hoping to give those that really want to be uh, delve into the world of investigative journalism uh, a resource, a tool to to be equipped to do that and do it not just not just say, hey, I can do a little bit of it, but to do it successfully. And that's what we're here for. And we want to be that resource. So I'm going to stop talking now and yield it back to our great moderator and our our board liaison, our our, our champion, Mr. Uh, Walter Smith Randolph. All right, and I'm going to pitch it over to our president, Dorothy Tucker, who has been an investigative reporter in her hometown of Chicago for going on, what, three decades now, and just <laughs> received a, a great award from uh, the Chicago Headline Club for her work as well. So, um, Dorothy. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, I uh, am working today, but uh, I didn't have to go on TV, so you guys don't get the TV made up person because I've been working on a, a story that airs on uh, Sunday about how Black women are the target of crimes, not just when it comes to violent crimes, but nonviolent as well. Uh, we looked at data from the Chicago Crime Report and discovered that if you go the last 21 years, for every white girl under the age of 18, there were one white girl and 18, 18 black girls who were victims of assault. So that is the sort of story uh, that we will be telling on Sunday. Uh, it, we have victims, uh, we have experts. It will be the first, a three-part series. Uh, at some point, we will talk about solutions. Uh, so this is one of those stories that I, I hope one of the things that I want to do uh, with this task force is to share our stories so that we can uh, all kind of perhaps duplicate some of these stories because you and I both know that in your city, the numbers are very similar because it's a national problem. So it's a matter of getting the data, finding the victims, finding the experts, and then pushing for the policymakers to make a difference. You know, and that's what we're trying to do. If we call the alarm, uh, then perhaps somebody will stop and say, hey, what's the cause of this issue and what do we do? So obviously I'm very passionate about investigative um, journalism and uh, I, I am thrilled that Walter and Curtis, uh, Madison, uh, Tanya, all of you are, are doing this. And I, I guarantee you that it will only get bigger and better as time goes on. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Thank you so much, Madam President. And just to just give everyone a little background about how this all started, um, you know, the, a bunch of us here are investigative reporters and we see each other in ABJ, we see each other at IRE. Uh, there's only a few of us. Uh, and there was a, a thread last year about the best investigative reporters in the nation. And uh, it was going on for a few hours and they were all white people. 
And we just, we just like, we couldn't believe that no one could name any people of color who were, were fantastic investigative reporters. And so we said, we really got to get our name out there. We really got to let people know what we're up to. Um, so I'm going to bring our panelists here uh, to the, to uh, the spotlight here in a second, but I do want to show you a brief sampling of some of the panels that we're going to have at convention. Um, and so hopefully you can see my screen. You can, okay, cool. So we're gonna have an investigative writing panel that's going to be with Madison Carter and Jeff Harris, who's the news director at WBBM in uh, Chicago. Uh, he's Dorothy's boss, so you know he's gotta be a badass. Uh, we'll also have a broadcast show and tell for the first time. We're gonna have uh, digging deeper on deadline, how to turn, how to quick turn investigative stories because we know a lot of you are in newsrooms where um, you may be General Simon and you're trying to pitch over to um, uh, to to the investigative unit. We'll have a consumer reporting panel with Carice Jackman, who is a national consumer investigative reporter for Investigative TV. Uh, another one is. Um, Finding Balance, Juggling Investigative and Other Roles. And uh, Kenan, who's a news director in Detroit, will uh, be on that panel, as well as Sierra Putman, uh, Jatera, and Daphne Durrett, who is at the Marshall Project. We also have an investigative writing class, as I mentioned before. Oh, I put this up twice. But um, we also will have um, Stephen Stock, who's going to show us how to investigate on deadline. That's always a great uh, panel. And we'll also have... Um, uh, some master classes in data journalism, um, how to find some numbers. We'll have Ron Nixon again. And uh, we just confirmed Cheryl Thompson, who's at NPR, used to be at the Washington Post. She's going to do the ABCs of investigative journalism. So we're going to have a lot of folks. Show of hands, who's going to Birmingham? Okay. Okay. Hopefully we get some more hands up. More hands up. All right. Sounds good. Uh, you know, early bird registration closes soon. Um, so we ask that you please make sure that you register. Um, and we've, and uh, we've sold out six hotels. So, uh, you know, if you're looking, we're, we're uh, suggesting people look at Airbnb. Um, but yeah, so let's get started with our panel. So first up, I am going to bring... Oh, Walter. Yes. Yeah, I just do for the one panel uh, with Jeff Harris. Uh, that is the one panel that if you, if anybody in particular wants to see their work critiqued, uh, what Jeff will do is take two or three stories, four stories in the course of that time and really go through those stories. Use that as an example to say, this is where you could have uh, brought this out, you know, think about this next time, that sort of thing. So let Walter, let, let Curtis know in particular, let Curtis know, uh, you know, which of you would like to send your work ahead of time so he can look at it, look at the script. Uh, he is he is a master I, I think Curtis had that experience last year, and I, I think it was a good one. So um, that is that is something that you should all take advantage of. It's not for the faint at heart. Let me say that <laughs> if you gotta, gotta if you gotta be ready for him because he will definitely let you know about your work. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's, oh, sorry. That's, no, I was saying that's why he's won every award in the world, though. So you know. <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. So we're going to get started with our panelists. So um, I have them spotlighted here on your uh, screen. So we'll start with uh, Alexandra Burris. If you want to introduce yourself and tell us uh, a little bit about what you do, where you're from. Hi, I'm Alexandria Burris, Alex for short. I am an investigative reporter with the Indy Star in Indianapolis. Um, I have a business background. I was actually on the business desk before I joined the I team. And now I write about everything from business to um, working on something about churches at the moment. And um, yeah, wherever they need me to fill in, public safety, et cetera. And so I hope that I can give you guys some decent advice to get you started on the path that you want to go down. Hey, thank you so much. Next up, we have Tanya Simpson, who is an investigative producer at ABC News. Hey, Tanya. Hi, uh, Walter. Thank you guys so much for having me and thank everybody um, who logged on tonight. Um, Tanya Simpson, I'm at ABC in New York. I'm an investigative producer with the I unit. I've been here for three years now. Um, I have been a producer for my entire journalism career. I actually started, well, I started as a reporter, but that was very brief. <laughs> I was a line producer and then I convinced somebody to um, let me run their investigative unit. And I've been doing that ever since here at ABC. I don't really have a beat. Um, I cover any and everything that they'll let me, um, but I do have a lot of experience doing consumer investigations. That's kind of where I really jumped in when I started off doing investigative journalism. 
Thanks so much, Tanya. And next oh, and up, I'm from Chicago. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, next up, we have Kid and Oliphant, who is uh, the news director at WXYZ, the ABC station in Detroit. Hey, Kenan. Hey, everyone. It's good to see everyone here, everyone on the panel. Um, again, I'm Kenan Oliphant. I'm the news director um, here in Detroit. I'm from Detroit. Um, I started my career on air. And I was a chief investigative reporter, a chief investigative consumer reporter for years. Um, won a bunch of Murrows and Emmys for uh, investigative reporting and decided to go into management uh, where I felt like I could do more good um, and hiring people of color, building up investigative teams. I was in charge of um, investigative teams my entire career until I really became a news director. I guess technically I'm still in charge of, it, but I just don't have my hands in it on a day-to-day -day basis like I used to, and I, I sort of miss that. Um, but I, like Alex, I hope I can give you great advice um, and that you can use it to further your career. Okay. Um, so my first question is going to go for Kenan, but before we do that, I'm going to show a little clip, and I did not tell him I was going to show him this, but I went to the archives and YouTube. Oh, Jesus, no. Dig this up. No. <laughs> and it's been a deadly start to the Memorial Weekend. The Dayton police are investigating two separate shootings where two men have died and a child was hurt. This is a live picture from the 100 block of North Paul Lawrence Dunbar. As you can see, a police car there, yellow tape blocking part of the street where this investigation continues to develop. There was a shooting there that happened around 9 o'clock tonight. Officers say a 34-year-old man was shot and killed while he was... All right, I'm going to stop that because I feel like every second it goes by, Kenan wants to kill me more and more. But I wanted to show everyone that to uh, kind of just show, you know, your arc from investigative reporting, from to fill in anchoring, to anchoring, to now running investigative teams. Kenan, can you tell us a little bit about what you look for when you're looking for an investigative reporter? You know, I've been thinking about this question ever since you asked me to be on this panel. And my honest answer is I think every reporter that I hire should be an investigative reporter. I don't think that there should be, um, you know, at the at the most basic level, right? Like everybody should be digging and looking for the most information to help the audience. But an investigative reporter has a special sort of skill set in terms of knowing where to go, sourcing people, um, and and having a well to go to, just developing people sources and understanding uh, what that story is, maybe even some sort of data mining, um, data journalism skill. And then, you know, somebody who doesn't, who's, who's a bulldog, who really isn't afraid of people yelling at them, dodging them, uh, being elusive, and still really going after the answers um, needed to make the story complete for the audience. Right. Um, and you talked a little bit about your jump from, you know, being on camera to wanting to go into management. How do you think, um, you know, those skills have helped you in, in your career? Um, and, and do you miss anything about, you know, being on, on air? After watching that video, I miss nothing. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I mean, I think, I think the jump from investigative to uh, running an I team, because that's what happened. I was an investigative reporter for five years in Dayton, where that you saw that clip. But then I became a morning EP uh, and a special projects, what we call then a special projects EP. Uh, but I ran an I team that was called Target Nine that I developed and created uh, for a startup NBC station in Myrtle Beach. Um, and I just find working with reporters more exciting, um, like developing the story ideas, getting the tips, um, and really watching people who I felt were better than me at it, um, go after answers for people, uh, and just being able to have conversations, uh, and see something that goes from 
an idea to what goes on television um, as the final product to me is really exciting. And I and 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 my whole mantra was if people aren't talking about us, then we're not doing our jobs because people are going to be upset about it. And normally they're upset because we've told the truth about something and they wanted to hide it for so long. Um, and then you do have some legitimate people who are like, you got something wrong or you didn't you didn't talk to this person and that happens. Um, and so we follow up uh, and and make sure that we we found all sides of stories. So um, I like what I'm doing now. Uh, but, you know, there are there are days where I miss working hands on with the investigative team. Now my assistant news director does that. OK, thanks so much. And so um, we'll pivot to Alex. Um, I'm going to show a few um of uh, the uh, headlines from stories that you said that, you know, help break into the investigative unit. You said you were, I think, on the business desk. So this one is uh, Scott Jones called called his tech boot camp a Ferrari. Now it's mirrored in debt and doubts. Um, and then there was another one. I, I put the same one twice by accident. But can you tell us a little bit about how you find that story and how you were able to pitch it and get into investigations? Yeah, so this was... Um... So I'm like the newest member of the Indie Stars investigations team. And this was my first uh, investigation that I published uh, being on the team. Um, this came from a tip. It came from a tip uh, that uh, Scott Jones, just to kind of explain who he is, uh, was a, is a very, well, he was a very uh, rich person, a multimillionaire. He, um, at one point, he was a uh, very flamboyant personality. He he revolutionized voicemail, um, the system that we have today and use on our cell phones and landlines, if you still have those. Um, he made it easier and less expensive to store voicemails at um, a large in a large quantity, and he, it made him very rich. And he was very influential in Indiana. Um, started a bunch of companies. One was a tech coding boot camp, uh, and it went belly up recently. And we found out um, basically by tips, people who gave us this um, reached out to us, gave us the sourcing, and um, I was able to report that story mainly by looking at 990s and also just um, tracking down people who worked in and. and in, in the school, as well as people in the business community who would talk to me um, about Scott's relationship, his spending habits, um, just really going through the tax documents and being able to tell the story and, and figure out how he was spending money um, that the state was giving him. And so that's how that story came about. Was it difficult to pitch to the, do you have an investigative team or unit? Uh, was it difficult for you know to pitch it? Did you know? Did you have any challenges there? No, um, I fortunately am on a team. Yes, we do have a um, and the indie store has an I team, and fortunately, I am on a team that um, I have not been told no yet um, by my editors. Everything I've wanted to pursue, I've been given the space to do it and the support to do it. So, I think I'm kind of blessed in that area. All right, thank you, Alex. And then Tanya, if you want to tell us a little bit about, um, actually, I have a I have some video here too as well. One of the first stories um, that you produced to help get you into the investigative lane from WTMJ in Milwaukee. So we'll play a little bit of that. Stolies. It's a street term many people use for stolen cars. And as Milwaukee deals with a rash of violent crimes related to car theft, it's a trend many people would like to see go away. Our digital director, Marcus Riley, is here with the details on an online investigation on the impact of the stolen culture. Well, teens taking a car and joyriding is hardly a new phenomenon, but you don't have to crunch the numbers very closely to see that taking a car without consent is much more serious than a youthful rite of passage. In the Milwaukee area, it's a weekly, if not daily occurrence. Cars stolen, sometimes taken by force, leading to chases, crashes, and sometimes death. I said, wait a minute, where did I park? And I'm like, wait a minute, my car is gone. Amy Robinson is a special ed teacher at North Division High School. Her Dodge Caravan, which just so happens to be the vehicle most likely to be stolen in the city of Milwaukee, was swiped twice from the school parking lot. Some kids, they take it to be a thrill to actually steal cars like that. 
you know, and then to be told, and then to talk about it later on, because it's like it's a culture with these kids now. The Stolies phenomenon is so pervasive in youth culture that it has its own dance on YouTube. And this statistic says it all. The median age of a driver involved in a Milwaukee police pursuit in 2003 was 40. Last year, it was 18. Breon Walker wasn't even 16 before he stole nine cars. And it... So, Tanya, can you tell us a little bit about how that story came together and how you kind of made the transition from, you said, line producer to running a unit to making it to the network? Yeah. Um, so I'll answer the last question first. Um, just kind of giving an overview of my career trajectory. Um, like I said, I started as a line producer. My first job out of college was in Greenville, South Carolina at WIFF. Um, I was there for a little while. Again, I'm from Chicago. I got an opportunity to go to Milwaukee um, to work at the ABC station there. There I was a line producer. Um, and occasionally I would get to produce specials and I figured out like, you know what, I really like this. Like I want to do more of this. Um, but there wasn't really space for me to do that there. So I actually left news for a little while. Don't tell anybody. Um, I did PR for Milwaukee County for a little over a year. I wanted to get back in news. I had a friend who went to TMJ4 in Milwaukee and she told me they were restarting their investigative unit. And I said, I wanna do that. Um, so I convinced their news director and assistant news director to interview me. Um, they put me through it, but they hired me to do it. Um, I was executive producer of investigations and special projects there. Um, I got to do a lot of cool stuff in that job, but a lot of times it was more like a day side EP. Those of you who are in newsrooms know how that goes. Like when you're understaffed, it's all hands on deck. Um, and again, I love that job. I'll talk more about Stolies in a second, um, but I, it was more management than I kind of wanted to do at that stage in my career. Like, Kings, I really missed creating content. Um, so then I got an opportunity to go to Raleigh, uh, to WTVD. Um, I always wanted to work for an O and O, so um, I took a job as an investigative producer in Raleigh. And from there, I ended up in New York. Um, I met my now boss at a conference. Um, and she was like, I, I think you're great. I like your work. What do you think about coming to New York? And I was like, I don't. My plan was to go home to Chicago when I left Raleigh. Um, but I said yes, and I'm really glad I did. Um, so that's the TLDR version of how I got here. Um, Stoli's was something that the story idea came from a police press conference. Uh, the Milwaukee police had a press conference about stolen vehicles. The story was in 2017. Um, and the headline of that press conference was, here are the most stolen cars in Milwaukee. Like everybody in Milwaukee realized that stolen cars were a problem. Like it was happening all the time. There were all these crashes. And so like they had this, here are the top five cars. We're encouraging people to get clubs, do this, do that. And there was one thing as I was listening to this news conference that jumped out at me, the then police chief said, you know, cars are getting stolen more and more and the ages of the suspects are getting lower and lower. And I was like, wait, what? Um, and so I asked some follow-up questions. I started looking into it. Um, that's how we found out about Stoli's, found the YouTube videos, the dances. Um, and I got our digital director, Marcus, involved because I was like, I think this could be something really cool to do for the website like if they're not going to give a space in a show because again like you know local newscast I was like I don't know if we can tell this story in two and a half minutes I think we're going to need more time um so Marcus got involved I think it was about a four month project um because me and it was a team of people everyone working on it also had to keep up with our daily jobs while we did it um, and anybody who has ever tried to get police records or court records in a juvenile case knows how difficult that can be. Um, so it was a lot of trips to the juvenile detention center to put in requests and read through records because you can't take them off the property. Um, but eventually we did a multi-part, multi-platform project. And like I said, I think that is when I realized, okay, like, yep, investigations, like I can do this. I'm really good at this. Like I like consumer stuff, but I want to do like the big, big stuff. Okay. Thank you. So Alex and Tanya, can you tell us maybe what are some perks or benefits of being an investigative reporter? Um, time. I have a lot of time to work on stories that I otherwise would not have. I think that's the biggest perk. And then people are in awe of the job title. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> Tanya? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, time, especially now in my position. And I always tell people my current title is investigative producer, but I am basically an off-air reporter. Um, like that's just how it works at the network. Sometimes you have a correspondent you work with. A lot of times you don't. Like, so you are the reporter. Um, but yeah, like Alex said, like the time that we get to work on stories a lot of times, especially when it's not breaking news. Um, yeah, people are in awe, but sometimes I think that's a double-edged sword because sometimes people see investigative in that email and it automatically freaks them out. Like, even if you're just coming to them for information on background or as an expert, like the automatically, like they, they get a little defensive. Um, and like Alex said earlier, something that I found in my current position is a lot of times having the opportunity to just see about things. Like I, I've been told no a couple of times, um, but it doesn't happen often. But I think as an investigative reporter, a lot of times you just have to dig to see what's there, if anything. And so that is a big perk, like having the space to see what's what. And can I ask you for the downsides, what do you think are some, uh, how do you manage the downsides? Because I know, you know, like Tanya said, sometimes you send people an email and they're like, what are you investigating? You just want some records. And also sometimes in the newsroom, you know, other reporters or producers might say, have they turned a story yet? What are they working on? What are they working on? Who, you know, who do they think they are? How do you balance that as, as when you were a reporter, when you were a producer and now as a news director? I mean, I think it gives me some sort of context and perspective as a news director, understanding what my investigative team is going through, right? Um, if they have FOIA'd everything under the sun and, you know, we fight sunshine law, you know, it's just, there's, there's always a fight and the deadline is never, it. <laughs> some, sometimes we put something on the calendar, or I should say most of the time we'll put something on the calendar. It never airs on that day. Because something else always happens. We never get the FOIA back. We don't get the person that we need to talk to. Something ends up being wrong, you know. Um, and so I understand that. And to a, to a certain extent, right? Like, we do got to produce something. We have to have a product. But uh, I, you know, I can ask questions uh, to my investigative team. Have they thought about certain avenues or angles uh, to the story to try to help, uh, you know, push something along? Um, and then, you know, at, when I was, and when I was doing the job, uh, myself, just the drawback was, even though you had time, you had time. Um, and there would be other things coming into your pot, into your atmosphere that you're like, oh my God, that's a good investigative story. So now you're adding another iron to the fire, trying to figure out if, if that, when that'll turn, if that'll turn. And so you're just juggling a lot um, all at once. Right. And then also for you getting a, a follow up, um, what do you think are some mistakes employees often make when trying to get promoted to the investigative team? And what's your advice or tips for going about it the right way? Ooh, that's a really good question. Because <laughs> everybody really... wants to be on the I team, but not everybody can do it. It's funny, not in my career, not everybody wants to be on the I team. Um, you know, people's personality, it's a personality thing too, right? I mean, you have to kind of look at people and figure out, are, you know, are you the type that's going to, I was, like, I was the type that always took a call. I don't care if it was in the middle of the night. Um, I, I was just determined, uh, uh, to get, to get my story, um, or the stories that I was working on. So I worked constantly, you know, and now I, you know, there, in in like today's journalism, there are a lot of people who just want to put in a nine to five and go home. Well, that's not going to be your investigative journalist. Um, so if I see that, you know, in my staff and they come to me and they're like, well, I want to do something I team. Uh, well, okay. Have, did you show me something in your regular everyday reporting that would even give me an inclination that you would, you know, that you could possibly do it? Have you did you FOIA something? Did you go out and do some sort of data journalism? Are you looking through files? Like what, what are you doing beyond the, the scope of your current job now that builds out, you know, this, what you consider this regular general assignment story? Because I can guarantee you that that regular general assignment story has an investigative angle that you can pull out something uh, from it uh, to make it bigger. 
And so if you're just kind of mailing it in and I'm just kind of looking at you, you know, mailing it in, I, I wouldn't think you're a good investigator, wouldn't be a good investigative journalist. Okay. Um, and then Tanya and Alex, um, what is maybe something that you were not prepared for when you went over to the investigative side? And we'll start with Tanya with that. Oh, there was so much I think I was not prepared for. <laughs> um, one of the biggest things was being prepared to do accountability interviews. Um, I won't say unscheduled interviews, but accountability interviews like that is really a skill. Um, I, I was not prepared for how nerve wracking, at least for me, those can be like sitting across from somebody who you know is trying to hide something, uh, keep something from coming out, you know is not telling the truth and navigating that, like asking the tough questions, asking the follow-ups, um, but not doing too much, recognizing that it can backfire and make you look a certain way. Um, I think that that's one of the biggest things that I, I was not prepared for and that I still work on and still practice. Yeah, I would say um, a couple of things. I've always worked a lot, um, but I feel like I do, I do work more now than I did when I was on the business desk. Um, coming to the Indie Star it was... It was really a nine to five. Um, I would always write in the middle of the night. That's like just the best time for me to think. But now I find myself having like eight o'clock dinners with like sources, um, people I'm interviewing over dinner. I'm up earlier in the morning writing. Um, there have been many days where I have been in the, I've come back to the office, we're hybrid here, but um where I'm just like in the office at like seven, eight o'clock at night. So that's, that has been a big change. The other thing was the rigorous editing process it was like once the story was done and I've always written long, I just turned into an 18 page story um, is sitting down with my editor and literally going line by line and dissecting the story and fact checking. And it's just to another level and can I just add on to that? Because that's a really good point, like the editing process. And for me, legal and standards, like I, I was not ready. Like I thought I knew back when I was an EP and like I would look over reporter and producer scripts and, you know, like we would send it to, you know, the scripts lawyer and they'd be like, yeah, this looks fine. But now like when it's me and I have written it and like, like I, yeah, it, it, can be grueling and brutal. For example, um, one big project that we just launched a couple of weeks ago, me and the team were on a legal and standards call on a Sunday for three and a half hours. Wow. 45 minutes of which was spent debating one line. <laughs> Isn't that great? They don't, they don't teach you that on law and order, right? You can watch all the law and order no, you, you no. want and you're not ready for legal and standards. <laughs> <laughs> So especially when you have to, especially when you have to, and like legal and standards, when you have to um, send all of your source documentation to legal, and if it doesn't match up with what you've written, I mean, that line, I mean, you're right. It is so tedious. It makes you want to pull your hair out. And that's also part of like the deadline thing too that I was talking about earlier. Like, you're just like, okay, you, you might come to the end of it and you're like, okay, well, we got to go and get something else, you know, and it makes the story longer. Uh, and, you know, you have to figure out different ways. Like now you're thinking about, and this is what I think about a lot now. If I only have a certain amount of time in a newscast for an investigative story, let's say it's three, four minutes long. Um, and now my story is seven minutes, eight minutes. Like, do I, how do I break that up? Does one go on TV, another one go on like a digital platform? Does it all go digitally? There's so many other platforms to now do investigative and like show your work, but you're trying to figure out where the audience is for it. I think that's like the new, like for me, like the new space that I wasn't prepared for. Um, all the other different areas um, where you can have investigative content. But 
yeah, that legal and standards that just gave me a a flashback. <laughs> I, <laughs> I just and we like did it. we did have a relevant question in the chat. It um, said, "Have you ever uh, suffered any legal ramifications or pushback?" I know. Um, I know I get threatened to get sued once a week, but has anybody have actually been subpoenaed or had to, you know, testify or actually been sued or anything like that and how you dealt with that? Uh, I get subpoenaed I, every day. And how do you, how do you deal with part that? Of the, I mean, it's just a part of the gig. You know, I get the subpoena, I send it to my lawyers. Um, I make sure that all, you know, all documents, video, anything written down on any sheet of paper about it is saved. All of that is compiled and is sent to my legal team um, at Scripps. Uh, and then they um, have lawyer, uh, a law firm here in Detroit that they work with. Uh, so they work in tandem and then anything that they need, uh, we supply. Uh, thankfully, I've never personally been sued or have had to defend um, a story, but my investigative team has. And so we've had to do depositions and things like that. We're going through a couple now. Um, I can't get into the details of it, but uh, I think, you know, we're buttoned up enough uh, to where we minimize risk uh, and we should be okay, but it's nerve wracking. That's the other part where you're not you might not be prepared for when you jump in is like actually being sued because you're like, Oh my God, that's my name. That's my reputation. Uh, what, like, how's this going to end up? Like you're just nervous and then you become, you know, for some people you might become gun shy on stories. Um, and that's the worst part when you start like second guessing yourself. Cause then you really start making mistakes. Anya? Sued and called out on the internet even when people are wrong, like prepared for that. Um, I have not personally been sued or, you know, had to testify. Um, but for that same story, I was just talking about when we were on a three and a half hour call with legal and standards, um, we, we did get like a scary gram. Like we got bullied, um, from this big corporation. We did an interview. It was a disaster of an interview. They knew it. Um, they sent an email claiming that we had made an agreement to not air certain portions <laughs> of the interview, which was not true. Um, that I did feel supported by my legal and standards team. Thankfully, like I talk to my crews, like I tell them to keep rolling, like after the interview, like when their side talk, like just because of that. So we had the whole interaction on camera. And I saved all of my emails um, from this PIO who sent this email, like kind of vaguely threatening us, like if we use part of the interview. Um, so it, it worked out in the end. Um, and, but yeah, the lawyers were ready to go. Like they agreed to be on a call if I wanted them to be. Um, they said that I could handle it myself if they wanted, but it was just kind of a, like whatever you need. And 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 Alex? Yeah, I haven't been, I mean, I've been threatened. I've been threatened with lawsuits before, even when I was on the business desk. I'm not, honestly, not too worried about it. Um, we are having this conversation in our newsroom now uh, because one of our reporters was uh, subpoenaed to be in a deposition for a medical board hearing. Um, our position, my position, and I, I think my editor and my uh, other colleague on the IT would agree with me is that we don't sit for depositions. Um, we have we always fight subpoenas. We you go. I think as a as a reporter, especially when you're dealing with sources, you protect. You go to the ends of the the earth to protect your sources, even if that means going to jail. Um, that is what I was taught in journalism school. I still believe that, and that's what we're standing by. So. Um, and we'll get to some more questions here in a second, but I, I do want to show some of the great work that everyone on, on this panel has been doing. Um, and so, uh, um, Alex, I have yours up right now. Um, seems like you are shutting some clubs down in uh, Indianapolis. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about these stories? Um, yeah, this was a fun, uh, actually kind of a fun story to work on. Um, we went down the rabbit hole. So this, 
This series actually started last year before I even joined the I team. Um, Tony Cook is my colleague, uh, and at the time he was working with another, a former colleague, Ryan Martin, on um, looking at violence at bars in Indianapolis. And um, Ryan left, and then I joined Tony on on the series, and Tony and I started looking at influence because the bars that they had pre previously looked at um, had like a lot of reports of violence. Um, there were people who were killed at bars. Um, and so Tony and I looked specifically at strip clubs. Uh, and that story is the result of a very large database that um, we had to compile uh, pulling every single incident report that took place at a strip club going back five years and then getting the probable cause reports from the courthouse um, and then going down a deep rabbit hole where we started looking at how these bars were able to stay open according to the state's alcohol licensing regulations. Um, Indiana has a like a good character clause where you have to have a good and fine character to have a liquor license in the state. Um, and these strip clubs had reports of prostitution, drug use, multiple shootings. I mean, it was kind of like the Wild West. Um, and so we started looking for influence, any political donations. Um, the people who are in charge of representing these bars are not in charge, but have been hired to represent these bars are former heads of the alcohol licensing board. Um, and as we were doing this, we, you know, we submitted FOIAs to get the ownership records, the licensing, um, found out that there were people from out of state, Las Vegas, Tennessee, um, who were owners of these bars. And to make a long story short, um, we did go through SEC documents. We uh, went and sat through actual meetings and someone turned up to the board meeting who was not on any of the ownership documents that had been submitted to the state. He, for lack of a better, he looked like a pimp, um, had a velvet shirt, <laughs> pinky rings, gold chains. I mean, it was like something out of a Hollywood movie. And we were like, who is this person? Um, and so we ended up tracing back his connections, found out that he was the son of a woman who was the beneficiary of a trust that was a majority owner of one of the strip clubs. And um, he also had been accused of racketeering. So the, the strip club has now shut down. And how long did you, you put a pimp out of business? Um, how long did it take you uh, uh, to put that story together? Um, it took us several weeks because we kept running into dead ends and it, all, it always felt like we started, it was like a spider web and we just kept pulling every thread we came across. Um, I want to say we worked on that for about a month before we figured out who he was and um, was able to like turn the story over. And, and he would not talk to us, um, but it, it took about a month for that series. And then we would follow up on every meeting that happened um, after that. And there's an, uh, we actually had a story yesterday that uh, we, the, one of the public safety writers wrote. Um, about a bar owner who had actually threatened to sue my colleague, Tony Cook. Um, but that, that bar was a part of this series as well, so. Okay, and we'll turn to um, Tanya. We have this story that you worked on. Let's play it. There are times when a name fits a little too well and that's how it feels out in rural Louisiana, in this very real town called Waterproof, where most things here have seen better days. It's becoming a norm for me to get up in the morning and twist the knob and no water. 
The irony is they're surrounded by water. Mighty Mississippi runs right behind the levees that keep the town dry. But what happened here in 2018 now happens all the time. You went to cut your water on, you didn't have water, and everybody that got a phone was calling all over town. Is your water off? They had to go months without life's most basic necessity flowing into their homes after a water line broke down. If your family was in these types of positions and in these conditions, you would be down here. Five years later, and there's still plenty of righteous anger in their voices. And even when it's working, sometimes this is what comes out of the tap. So at that point, we get bottled water to warm in the microwave and put on a towel to take a bath. Wow. Bottle. That's how you take a yes, bath. Yes, yes. Warm it in the microwave, yes. put it on a towel. Yes. See, I wouldn't be able to wash this so that I can, you know, get somebody something to eat. Yeah. Marcella Rollins is trying to live the dream and make a living with a new food truck. Well, I love to feed people. Good. She says the water lines don't go, like I, I'm going to go back and watch this uh, when we're done with this. But I do have to say before I, you get into how you got the story together, you always seem to find some interesting characters. I've noticed in both your stories, Thank you. you find some folks who tell it like it is. I mean, what's, what's your, your uh, secret to success to get those people on camera? I talk to everybody. I, I really do. <laughs> I talk to everybody. My friends, my partner will tell everybody like this girl that she she doesn't, she makes friends everywhere. I, she can walk into a room full of strangers. She'll walk out with a room full of the best friends. Um, so I really do just like chat with everybody. Um, and that woman in the food truck, like she was not even a scheduled interview and she ended up being one of the central characters in that story. Like I literally met her at the town hall at Waterproof and convinced her to let us follow her home to her food truck. Um, but how that story came together, um, after the water crisis in Jackson, um, I, I wanted to find the next Jackson. I pitched that to my boss before I had done a, a lick of research, anything. I was just like, we should find the next Jackson. That's our <laughs> investigation. Um, knowing now what I know then I, I should have like worked on it first before I took it to her because she was like, that's a fantastic idea. Yes do it. Um, and then I very quickly discovered that doing that was a lot harder than it sounded. Um, just because what happened in Jackson, as a lot of you probably realize, was just kind of a perfect storm of a bunch of different factors. Um, but what I did was I started looking at water infrastructure I found a group, the American Society of Civil Engineers, and they actually put out a report card every year where they grade states based on their drinking water. Like they grade them in several different areas, but drinking water is one. Um, and so I started digging through that and I saw that Louisiana consistently had a D minus, like for years and years and years, it wasn't getting better. So I was like, well, what's up in Louisiana? Like, why are they getting like such bad grades? Um, so started looking into those records, saw that Louisiana's infrastructure is so old, like some of the oldest water pipes in the country exist in Louisiana. Um, so then I started reaching out to lawmakers and residents there like, well, what's being done about it? You know, it's a problem, right? Um, so then I discovered that the state actually was trying to do something about it. They had set up this water commission um, to distribute federal funds, like all of the funds that came through the ARPA loans. They were like, we want to make it fair. We want to give it to towns and parishes to upgrade their water system. So like they had a whole application process. Um, I requested and got those records. So I was able to see all of the applications, um, all of the scorecards and how they paid it out. And there were two parishes that got the highest awards. Two parishes were awarded about $10 million. One of them was St. Tammany Parish, right outside of New Orleans, which is one of the most affluent areas in Louisiana. So I was like, well, that's weird. Like, why did they need this money? Um, and the issue there is that they're growing so big that their existing infrastructure just can't keep up. Um, but another parish, Tinsaw Parish, it's a tiny place in North eastern Louisiana, about 90 miles away from Jackson. And in the parish of Tinsaw is a town called Waterproof. And I was like, you can't make this up. Like, I, this has to make good TV, right? Um, so then I started doing research about Waterproof. I got in contact with Mayor Gerard Bodley of Waterproof. Yes, that is his real name. Um, got him on a Zoom and was like, oh yeah, he, he is great TV. 
Um, and so it went from there. Like I called it kind of a tale of two parishes, like two very different parishes, one mostly white, one mostly black, one growing. Waterproof is literally a dying town. Um, and we did a story about how they're both struggling with water infrastructure, but for very different reasons. Um, and what the state is trying to do to fix it and how neither one of them, especially Waterproof, wanted to be the next Jackson. Right. Thank you so much. The last story we're going to show before we open up for questions is uh, from WXYZ. Heartbreaking story there. Well, most Detroit police officers enforce and follow the law. But our latest investigation is not about most officers. It's about the alarming number of police that have been accused of criminal acts and remain on the force today, even after being found to have committed wrongdoing. Here's seven investigator Ross Jones. So what happened today? It's October 20th, 2021 in Toledo, Ohio, and police just got a call from a woman who said her ex-boyfriend is stalking her. What's his last name? The night before, she said Larry Jenkins sent her a text message that said he was tracking her location. And this morning, she found him sitting outside of her apartment. When she tried to leave, she said Jenkins followed her car. And when she attempted to flee, he purposely rammed into the back of her vehicle with his. He rammed into the back of my car. Toledo police would arrest Jenkins, which was unusual for him because he's normally the one putting on handcuffs. Oh, they work for Detroit PD. Uh, I think so. Detroit police officer Larry Jenkins would be charged with menacing by stalking and criminal damaging. He would later plead no contest to disorderly conduct. Where is he today? Uh, officer Jenkins is still on the police department. At the third precinct? Uh, yes. Assistant Chief David Lavalley says Jenkins returned to the force after serving a 20-day suspension. But Sarah Rennie, executive director of the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence, said it's conduct that shouldn't be tolerated from those with a badge. It's a really dangerous, dangerous fact pattern. He stalked her. He harassed her. He hit her with a car. Tonight, our investigation reveals that Officer Jenkins is one of more than 150 Detroit police officers to be charged with a crime since 2016. Many of those officers remain on the force today after being found to have violated the laws they're supposed to enforce. How do you hit? So can, can you tell us a little bit about how that series uh, came together? And then also how you were able to balance that in your newsroom, because I know some newsrooms work very closely with the police and get a lot of pushback when they might do a negative story. Yeah, so um, I, I would say like maybe eight months before that happened, uh, there's an area in downtown Detroit called Greek Town, uh, and there was a, well, we'll just call it a fight. Um, between Detroit police officers and some patrons of a local bar. And on video, there was a Detroit police officer uh, who was caught literally punching some um, body in the face who was non-threatening, um, following police commands. And my investigative reporter thought, what's going to happen to this police officer? And so he tried to follow the um, disciplinary uh, pattern of, of this officer and through his, and through just you know just talking to people, we found out that there's this like secret quasi board of police commissioners um, here in Detroit that uh, takes complaints from residents about conduct, misconduct from Detroit police officers. And as you heard, there were like over 100 Detroit police officers who were being investigated for conduct on the coming. And it was just once we FOIA'd and um, got all the information, it was almost like a treasure trove of all of these officers who were being investigated by the department um, for everything from sexual assault to stalking and, uh, and just uh, just the things that you you know you wouldn't want a police officer to be investigated for in their personal lives and also trying to enforce the laws of Detroit um, and its citizens. 
Uh, and so we did a series of stories um, on a bunch of police officers and really holding the Detroit Police Department accountable for these officers that they still had on the force. And then it kind of snowballed even more because once we started investigating these officers, magically they would um, leave the Detroit Police Department, but then they would show up at other police departments in the metro area. So then we would have to go and talk to those departments about that. So um, that's how that came about. I, I mean, I just, I, Ross Jones, um, who you saw in that piece, who sat down with the assistant chief, is one of the best accountability investigative reporters I have ever seen. This guy is like a lawyer. I mean, he he knows the answer before he asks the question. And he does not let you veer off topic. He will corner you and make you kind of look silly uh, with questions. And he does it with like this baby face. Like I, I, I have never seen anything quite like it. Uh, and he's really effective at it. And it's just a skill that he's been able to develop over time. But um, when he's when he's doing those accountability stories and, and Detroit evaded us for months, really, we've been doing this story and going backwards in the story for over a year now. Um, and he was just determined to get any sort of answer. And if you go and look at this story even further, you will see the hypocrisy from the Detroit Police Department. And they're kind of like, I don't even know why this guy is on the force. Like, we'll have to look into that, you know, because he's been able to corner them through questions. I mean, he leads you down a row with questions, kind of veers off. He'll ask you the same question. I mean, he kind of does what police officers do. He'll ask you question the same question in about four different ways um, to get a to get the answer. So that's how that that that's how that came about. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a bunch of questions in the chat. Um, so I will answer, ask them to one of you, and then we'll kind of keep going through the questions. So Tanya, first one is for you. There's so many tips and story ideas out there. How does your team decide what to pursue so you're doing worthwhile work and turning regularly? Um, we ask for help. <laughs> Thankfully, I have a team, so it's not just me. Um, we have a lot of support staff, so we have production assistants, associate producers, we have interns, we just got a fellow from FAMU and very quickly, like, indoctrinated her onto the team on how to um, listen to our tip line and go through our emails. Um, and like, I, I think we do a pretty good job of explaining to them, like what to look for questions to ask when they're talking to people, um, and information to try to gather, uh, for them to like, bring it to one of us and be like, Hey, I think this is something. Um, and we also teach them like, if you're not sure, like trust your gut and bring it to us anyway, and we'll figure it out together. Um, so for me, I think that is the, the biggest thing, like having help, um, but when you don't have help, because I haven't always been a part of this big of a team, um, it's like Kenan said, like, take the call, answer the calls, <laughs> respond to the emails, listen to yourself. I think we all as journalists have that thing that tells us when something isn't quite right or when we need to ask a follow-up question or we need to keep looking. Um, so like if you ever like your spidey senses start tingling about something, follow up on it. Okay, thank you. Um, Alex, um, how do you deal with reservations in your reporting after a, a lawsuit or a social backlash? Well, I've never been sued. Um, but a backlash, I, you know, you deal with it and keep going. I don't put a lot of thought into it. I can't dwell on it. Um, when we did the strip club story, we, one of the stories in the series was about the club shutting down um, and about a raid that took place on uh, the strip club that we were investigating. And when, after it published, some of the strippers got upset with me and called me, excuse me, dancers got upset with me and called me some names. Um, I just kind of laughed about it. I mean, I can understand why they would be upset. They made a lot of money there, so you can't take everything personally. 
Gotcha. Okay. And then Kenan, do you feel like there's a need to be even more transparent to viewers to rebuild trust with the public? And if so, how, how do you do that? I guess, you know, what do you mean by even more transparent, right? Like I, I mean, I think transparency is transparency. Like you show your process, you, um, you know, make all the phone calls and emails and text messages and you show like, you know, you show your process, you know, to the audience um, about what you've done to go about getting that story. Um, I think that's like the, I think that's the, one of the ways to do it. I'm not saying that it's the best way to, you know, for transparency. I mean, I think, you know, trust is earned. Um, I think with the audience here in Detroit or really anywhere, if you're, if you're consistently um, putting in good work and really, tr um, what am I trying to say here? Trying to reach out to everybody that you can and give everybody at least, a, you know, their say. Um, and if you're fair about it, your audience is going, they may not, people may not like it, but they know that they'll, they'll respect you. Um, and I think respect is what I'm after more than anything. Um, I don't, I don't care that you're mad. I don't care that you try to sue me, but um, if you respect my work and I was fair in the entire process, that's all I really care about. And then back on the lawsuit thing, I just want to say um, for um, Alex's question for the, um, for the audience in America, you can be sued for anything like, people will sue you for anything and it doesn't matter if you get sued it, it, what matters is do they have a case and and if you can and if and if you are buttoned up and your legal and standards team who helps you um stay buttoned up and minimize risk uh in the story there's really nothing to worry about um, another question, and if anybody has any other questions, please feel, feel free to put them in, in the chat. But this one, open up to everyone. Um, a very talented investigative journalist was killed. Um, I believe this, we're talking about the one that was in Las Vegas when he's working on a story. Do you take any special safety precautions? Are you nervous at all? So my, oh, go sorry. Ahead. Yeah, no, go, go ahead, ahead Alex. Oh, well, um, so my colleague, Tony, knew that reporter. Um, when we were working on the strip club story, we were staying late at the office. Um, my editor made sure to um, change my parking status so that I could have 24 seven parking in the garage. Um, because there, ha I guess, have been some threats against the Indie Star in the past. Um, I mean, there's nothing you can really do about that but that was one precaution other than that um no I try not to lose sight of why I'm doing this you know there's a need in our community for deep reporting for accountability reporting and it is a risk but it's one that I try not to think about or try to like make it bigger than what it actually is so Anybody else want to uh, do it before we wrap it up? Uh, yeah, I do get nervous because I think part of the question was like, do you get nervous sometimes? Yeah, especially depending on the topic and where I'm going. I travel a lot in my current role. Um, and thankfully, like the company, if depending on the situation where we're going, what we're covering, they will provide security like the team. Um, that's covering the high school shooting does have security with them while they're on the ground. Um, but other than that, I just try to be really aware of my surroundings. Um, like Alex said, like if I try not to stay too late, if I am leaving the office late, like I live in New York, normally I take the train, but if it's really late, like I'll call an Uber instead of doing that. Um, I try to be mindful about when I'm covering, like going into what could be um, a combative situation, like not being branded. So like carrying a big ABC backpack or like wearing a hat or something like that. Like, you know, I try to just blend in when I can where it makes sense. Um, but yeah, like like Alex said, like the, the job does come with a certain level of risk, but I try not to dwell on it, but I also just try to remember to be smart about it. I would say like at my level now, I'm worried about my whole newsroom. 
um, not just my investigative reporters, but any, my photographers, my GAs, um, even my sports, like you wouldn't think, but like even my sports reporters, I mean, they catch hell too. Um, and so when we are going into special situations, we will get um, security. Uh, I will, I, I've told everybody on my staff that if you ever in your gut, your spidey sense goes off that something's not right, you're the one out there in the field, leave. And then when you get to safety, call me or the newsroom and let me know that you've moved and 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 what's going on and i will never question you um because your safety is paramount um and i think that you really do have to listen i i put myself in a lot of stupid situations when i was an investigative reporter uh and looking back on it i'm like oh my god like i can't believe i did that and so i would guide i you know i guide my current staff now like if I see something going down that road, I'm like, nah, don't do it. Um, but yeah, that's that keeps me up at night, you know, with a staff of 114. That keeps me up at night. My producer is telling me I'm running too long. So uh, any final words of, of encouragement or maybe a resource that you would suggest or maybe, you know, something that you know now that you didn't know before? Um, just, uh, you know, quickly 30 seconds, uh, Tanya. Um, use the, use NABJ and the NABJ investigative task force as a resource, um, social media, like follow people, do not be afraid to reach out to people. Also IRE, like networking can be so important in this business, not just for investigative journalists, for, um, journalists period. And like I said, just trust your gut. Like you're in, you're on this panel for a reason. You're in this field for a reason. Like, you know how to do the work. Um, so yeah, okay. reach out if you have any questions to me offline, like email me, text me, tweet me, IG me. I'm not hard to find at all. Okay. Uh, no, it's the same as Tanya, really just, um, you, you're here for a reason. Um, Jatera, I'm going to talk about you real quick, but Jatera reached out to me, uh, what, a year ago or so when I worked in Cincinnati, I moved to Detroit. She was like, Kenan, I want to be an investigative reporter. And, you know, it was like the phone conversations, right? Like it was like talking through the process. Like, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Find that person who's in your corner, you know, find that person who's not just, you know, an ally, but a sponsor, you know, somebody who's going to like go to bat for you. Like I would, I would have gone to bat for Jatera had, you know, she given me the phone number to her boss. I would have been like, do it, you know? So um, that's my, that's my advice. You know, you can reach out to me too. I'm not hard to find um, either. And I love, you know, mentoring people and going to bat for folks. So. Right. And uh, Alex. Yeah. Um, I guess I will speak about imposter syndrome. Um, try not to let it get in your way. When I joined the Indie Star I team, I joined a team um in which my editor was one of the reporters who broke the USC gymnastics story. My other colleague had a Pulitzer. He was a Pulitzer winner. The other was a Pulitzer finalist. And then there was like little old me. Like I had a couple of awards, but their desks were stacked. Um, you're Like Tanya said, you're here for a reason and you can't let the doubt, the doubts that you may have internally get in the way of the work that you're trying to do. Sometimes taking the first step, even if you don't, if you're not sure it's the right step to take, take it anyway, because at least you've pulled that string, you've gone down that path, you know if it'll lead to something, and sometimes it'll lead you someplace that you just do not expect, so don't let the voices get in the way. Well, thank you so much, and um, I'll give the final words to Jatera and Curtis and uh, President Tucker. Uh, Jatera. I will be brief for the first time, as my producers would say, ever, and say thank you all for joining. Um, I've been putting in the chat, but make sure you're following us on all the, our social media pages so you know what's going on with the task force. Um, we can we can see and we've seen over the last several months that people are hungry to learn more about investigative journalism. So we're just trying to provide a platform where you guys can ask questions like this. Um, thank you so much to all the panelists. That was a really intriguing and interesting discussion. Curtis. 
I second everything Jatera said. I mean, what a rounding show of support from everybody. Everybody's so, so, so enthralling. I was like trying to pay attention to my kids, like screaming in the background. I'm like, look, I'm trying to focus. Here. <laughs> so This was really good. And I love the fact that we were able to do this. And I want us to continue to do it too. I see us in the chat here talking about it. Looking forward to meeting people at IRE. If you're going to be here, I'm in Orlando. I've worked in Orlando anyway, so I'll be here by default. But I mean, I'm going to the to IRE as well. So looking forward to meet some of you guys and catching up with some folks. And uh, but if you're in uh in Birmingham too, I'll see you there. But thank you all so much. Thank you. And Madam President, are you there? I am still here. Uh, okay. <laughs> awesome. Absolutely awesome panel. Awesome session. Uh, I will also be uh, in Orlando at IRE. I get in Wednesday night. I'll be ready for, uh, you know, what are those calls? A drink thing there, the adult beverage. So, you know, text me, hit me up, tell me, tell me, let me know where you are. Uh, and then I'll be there through Saturday. Uh, this was, this was, again, fantastic. And I, I promise you guys that we will continue to increase the number of uh, investigative panels that we have at NABJ, because clearly there is a desire and there's a need. Well, thank you everyone for your time. Um, thank you for coming. And we are going to post this on the web as well because we recorded it. And uh, please be sure to uh, follow the investigative task force on Twitter. It's NABJ Investigate and NABJ Investigative Task Force on Facebook and NABJTIF on Instagram as well. Thanks, everyone. And have a great night.